cause for Remembrance Day. CB24's Jamie Goodfriend joins us live with more on this. Jamie? Yeah, thank you very much, Rashmi. Throughout the day, we've had a whole uh, wide array of guests uh, from Holocaust survivors to educators, and uh, I'm really happy that we were able to speak uh, with uh, right now Michael Levitt, the president and CEO of the Friends of the Simon Wiesenthal uh, for Holocaust Studies. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you for uh, having me on on this uh, important occasion. It is extremely important, and I've been to uh, the center. I've been to your office. I've seen the incredible work that you guys have, uh, do on a daily basis. I'm curious, Michael, you know, you, you served five years a, as an MP, uh, but you announced last August that you were leaving to focus on you know, the work that you're doing right now in Holocaust studies and education. And I'm a little bit curious about that shift and how it's playing into this very important day. Well, this had also been something that I've been very engaged with during my uh, my time in Parliament. Uh, the writing of York Centre that I represented actually was the uh, had the largest population of Holocaust survivors in the country that resided there. So, um, really, to be able to come to Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Centre, an organization that is so committed to uh, um, to both Holocaust education um, and adv advocacy in fighting anti-Semitism and hate and all of its forms and defending human rights. Uh, these were issues that I was most passionate about. And on a day like today, on International Holocaust Remembrance Day, it's really an opportunity um, for all Canadians and for you know everyone around the world to be able to focus on the six million, not just as a number, the six million Jews who perished, not just as a number, but for us to have an opportunity to reflect on each and every one of those lives that was lost and those legacies that was stolen. Because each of those individuals didn't get a chance to have families to contribute, to make our world a better place. But we do have the survivors, such an important voice um, in Canada and globally, the voices of Holocaust survivors who carry those lost voices of those who perished on their shoulders. And uh, in Canada, we're lucky to have so many. We've had a number of events that Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center has put on today with survivors providing their testimony um, in schools and uh, in all sorts of different forums. You know, we were so delighted to have uh, Pincus Guter on our program yeah. earlier today to talk about his story. And I highly recommend everyone go to cb24.com to go check out uh, the video in that interview. I I I've been to the center before and I recall you know seeing on the large monitors you guys monitor acts of anti-semitism that are happening all around the world and Michael I'm, I'm curious what concerns you about the modern day version of anti-semitism uh, there are some differences especially you know back in the 30s and 40s there was no such thing as social media but I'm curious what concerns you about the modern form of anti-semitism Hugely concerning, hugely concerning. We're seeing a rise in anti-Semitism um, in Canada. Um, we're seeing it coming from the left. We're seeing it coming from the right. Um, and again, the the uh, you know in recent examples, we had uh, the Shar Hashemayim synagogue in Montreal vandalized with swastikas just a couple of weeks ago um, by a, an assailant who had a gas canister with him. It could have been so much worse. Um, I think the image of the rioter um, in the Camp Auschwitz hoodie is absolutely, uh, you know, a, in, in ways that our minds uh, coming out of the, uh, uh, the uh, insurrection in, in, uh, at the Capitol a couple of weeks ago. So we are seeing too many examples of Holocaust denial, Holocaust distortion, and anti-Semitism, uh, and again, the, the, on the very front line of Holocaust education, it's about bringing knowledge, creating awareness of the Holocaust in our younger generations. Um, the Azrieli Foundation uh, did a study a couple of years ago, 62% of millennials do not have an understanding on what the Holocaust was or the impact of, you know, the fact that six million Jewish lives were lost. We need to be educating, we need to be talking about the Holocaust, we need to be talking about our democracy and the importance of being able to stand up and fight hate, hate in all of, hate in all of its forms. Um, because we know that, again, um, you know, Simon Wiesenthal said it best, and that is freedom is not a gift from heaven. You have to fight for it every day of your life. That was Simon Wiesenthal's words, and it's what we're engaged on at Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center of combating that hate, the anti-Semitism, the racism, the discrimination, every time it rears its ugly head, 
And sadly, during COVID, when tensions are high and pressures are high, we see hate rising. And we know that anti-Semitism is the canary in the coal mine, the very first sign uh, that of hate that rears its ugly head throughout history and now too. It seems like the common thing. Back to you. Thank you, Jamie. OPP are investigating a murder in Tottenham. Officers responded to a call at a home on Clifford Crescent yesterday morning. They found the body of a woman inside the house. A male resident was arrested at the scene and remains in custody. Police say there's no threat to public safety and they remain on scene investigating. 455 and minus four. This is Toronto's breaking news. CP24 coming up. A Canada Post employee who worked at the facility dealing with a COVID-19 outbreak has died after contracting the virus. Those details coming up live at five is next. A worker at a Canada Post facility in Mississauga hit with a major COVID-19 outbreak dies after contracting the virus. It is important for the time being that all of us act as if the variants are spreading. Toronto's top doctor warns not to let your guard down as Ontario reports its lowest daily number of cases in two months. The city is cracking down on apartment buildings and condos after receiving nearly 2,000 complaints about masks in common areas. At the end of the day, I wanted to go to where I believed I was going to be happy and, and you know, um, I believe I am. And Toronto fans are officially introduced to the newest member of the Jays, former World Series MVP, George Spring. And I'm Stephanie Smythe. Welcome to Live at Five. Ontario is reporting 1,670 new cases of COVID-19 today. That is the lowest daily number of cases since November the 26th. Now, the province also recorded 49 more deaths. 25 of those are long-term care residents. Toronto Public Health reports 502 new cases. Elsewhere in the GTA, 342 cases in Peel, 171 in York, 63 in Durham and 48 in Halton. More than 55,000 tests were completed. Now, according to the Ministry of Health, the positivity rate is 4%. And we are learning a Canada Post employee has died after testing positive for COVID-19 amid a major outbreak at a Mississauga facility that's infected at least 224 workers. CB24's Christina Tenaglia joins us live now with the latest. Christina. Steph, this is a massive facility here in Mississauga. Canada Post describes it as a national hub. Some 4,000 or so workers work here. And according to Canada Post, since January the 1st, 200 and 24 of those workers have tested positive for COVID-19. It's unclear as to how many active cases there are now, but we can now report one death related to this facility. A man in his early 60s, who according to his union, was a pretty senior in his career in terms of his tenure here at this Canada Post facility. He was a mail handler. According to Canada Post and the union, he died and he tested positive for COVID-19. I'm gonna share with you a a statement from Canada Post. They say they can confirm an employee at Gateway East has passed away. The employee had tested positive for COVID-19 and was last at work on January the 19th, or that is the 18th, the correction from Canada Post. We offer our deepest sympathies to the family as they mourn the loss and respect their privacy during this difficult time. We are focused on supporting our employees who have lost a colleague while ensuring we continue to stringently follow the guidance and direction from Peel Public Health. Now, the union cupped W also released a statement and union workers have reached out to us with their concerns about health and safety here at the plant. The union says we have many questions for Canada Post and we are demanding answers. We've been told the cause of death is unknown. However, we do know that the member had recently tested positive for COVID-19 and worked at the Gateway East facility where an outbreak was declared. Postal workers have been on the front line since the beginning of the pandemic, making sure society can function. They are worried and tired and they demand answers. As for some answers to our questions, we asked Dr. Lowe, Peel Region's Medical Officer of Health. 
Uh, you know, certainly if uh, COVID-19 is identified in an individual who has recently been deceased, it is considered uh, one of potential many antecedent causes uh, of, the, of that individual's passing. Uh, our specific investigation into a Canada Post continues, and unfortunately at this time I'm not, a, I'm not able to disclose any further details until those are uh, reviewed and finalized. So that was my question to Dr. Lowe. I had asked him about his investigation because if somebody dies and is positive for COVID-19, that is listed as a COVID-19 related death, even if the cause of death was not COVID-19 according to provincial guidelines. So that's what I asked Dr. Lowe about and as he acknowledged, the investigation continues. As for what's taking place here, Canada Post did not get back to us in time for this broadcast to the number of questions we sent them earlier today, but they did say previously about any concerns about health and safety, they're following the guidelines and expertise of Peel Public Health. Back to you. Finalia in Mississauga. Thank you, Christina. Meantime, concern is growing in Barrie tonight, where 99 more people in Simcoe, Muskoka, have tested positive for a COVID-19 variant. Nearly all are linked to a long-term care home dealing with a severe outbreak. CP24 Steve Ryan, live outside Roberta Place with the latest today. Steve. Nick, it was just last week that uh, I reported from outside of Roberta Place up here in Barrie, and I said of the 127 residents in that long-term care facility, only six at the time were diagnosed with COVID-19, and at that time, only three staff members as well. Well, we fast forward till today, and now we learn that 125 of the 127 residents at this facility uh, have been diagnosed with COVID. There's 92 staff members affected, and there's been 40 six deaths as well. What's even more concerning is the fact that the 99 uh, strands that were identified up here in Barrie with regards to being the UK virus, the B117, that is expected to have all come from, or the majority of it anyways, has come from this long-term care facility. So it is causing a great concern for everybody up here both the families and even local residents that I've been talking with. Now, earlier on, I interviewed uh, Dr. Arya. He is a palliative care physician, and he's a co-founder of the Doctors for Justice in Long-Term Facilities. He's an advocate, and he provided his thoughts on what's going on. Take a listen. We're now into the second wave of COVID-19, well into the second wave. We're at a point where uh, over 1,500 people have died of COVID-19 in long-term care facilities. And this is not a new virus. I mean, it was just a couple of days, you know, it was just a couple of days ago, I believe, that, you know, we heard that, you know, it was a year ago that we had the first case of COVID-19 in our country. So we know, actually, and we have the evidence of how to stop the spread of COVID-19 in long-term care. We know how to limit the deaths and, you know, stop the suffering that keeps on going on and on. It's really a matter of political will. You can really hear the frustration in his voice, and uh, he is quite determined to get some changes made here. Uh, so we'll see what happens with regards to that. 46 lives lost. There are 46 Canadian flags planted in the snow outside of this uh, uh, facility right now in memory of those lost souls. Steph, I'll send it back to you. All right, Steve. Thank you. Well, the city is sending bylaw officers to apartment and condo buildings to assure people are wearing their masks in shared spaces. For more, let's go live now. CB24 Chanel Call. And Chanel, I know that the mayor was uh, very open with the number of complaints they have had for about 2,000 in total. That's right, Steph, but the city of Toronto is not telling us exactly which 12 buildings received those complaints. Uh, we're looking at some new data, though, from 311 that reveals that between August 2020 and January 2021, the city of Toronto received almost 2,000 complaints about people who were not wearing a mask or not wearing a mask properly inside residential buildings. Uh, according to this data, 75% of those complaints came from apartment buildings, 25% coming from residential condos. Uh, in response, Steph and Nick, the city now ramping up education and enforcement in those 12 buildings. Here's more on this from the mayor and people we spoke to here in City Place today. A further breakdown re revealed 12 locations with more than 10 complaints each. Our rent safety O team will follow up directly and in person on these locations with the landlords and property managers for each of these 12 locations requesting uh, to see their masking policy and looking to see if the signage is in place as we require. 
It, we will also make sure that uh, the, uh, the signage that we provided as a city from the beginning uh, is placarded and located throughout the building, and we will conduct a follow-up inspection on those places that have been the subject of these multiple complaints. Fortunately for me, I'm in good health. I'm a little younger, so I'm more concerned about those who maybe aren't so lucky. Um, but obviously, yeah, still very important. Some people are not using at all the, the mask, even if it's the notice in the elevators or in the building, around the building, and the people are not using the mask, some, some of them. Most people have been very safe, and when if they're not wearing masks, then they um, do come, and like when you're passing by, that they make a real effort to. And here's something you may not know. Provincial laws actually don't allow the city of Toronto to charge people for not wearing a mask inside residential shared spaces. But the city can charge residential business owners uh, for not putting up proper signage inside to uh, tell people to wear a mask. Back to you. Okay, Chanel Call Live for us. Thank you, Chanel. The federal government is looking to secure millions of smaller syringes for the Pfizer vaccine. The drug company made a request to Health Canada to amend the vaccine label to say that six doses can come from one vial, not five. Those doses, though, require smaller syringes, and as the agency reviews the change, Canada's procurement department is scrambling to source the items. If approved, Pfizer will ship fewer vials to Canada overall because Canada's contract with the vaccine maker is based on 40 million doses not vials. And Toronto's Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Eileen DeVille, will be answering your questions coming up live at 5.30. You still have time to send a question or a short video clip to now at cp24.com or tweet us at cp24 using the hashtag AskDrDevilla. CP24. It's 510 and minus 4. This is live at 5. The world is marking International Holocaust Remembrance Day. The Toronto sign in Nathan Phillips Square is dim. We'll hear from a Holocaust survivor coming up. Also ahead, the city making it tougher for non Toronto residents to get ice time following complaints from residents.